So thanks for attending. Um, so the webinar today is gonna be on a um, bit of a remote interviewing uh, 101. So we're gonna be talking about some top tips, uh, hints and tricks that we've been talking about with clients um, over the last um, couple of weeks with the COVID-19 situation ongoing. Uh, obviously it's kind of transformed the entire market and what people are doing to get around um, their hiring. So um, what we'll be covering today is a little bit of sections on um, what we're doing here at Hacker Job. So some new tooling we're doing, some um, some learning we've got around employee branding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just to introduce ourselves, so I'll let uh, James introduce himself and then I will. Yeah, good afternoon, every, afternoon everyone. Um, sorry, a little issue with my video, so I'm not broadcasting my video, but you've got my photo, so I hope that will suffice. Um, yeah, my name's James, I'm a senior account executive at HackerJob. Um, I've been working with HackerJob for a little under three months now, uh, so fairly new to the organisation. Um, prior to this, I spent three years supporting brands across all industries uh, to combine software into their human recruitment processes. Um, with the view of delivering the best possible candidate experience. Um, in total, I've got over 12 years experience working in uh, SaaS software organizations. Um, in my current role, I work with new enterprise clients to help them solve their challenges with recruiting technical talent. Uh, the main challenges being uh, decreasing time to hire, uh, cost per hire, and uh, getting their messages to cut through the noise. Cool. Uh, so I'm Darren. Uh, I've been with Hacker Job since 2017, so quite a bit of a journey um, overall. I've been involved in the recruitment market since um, well, 2012, so uh, seven, almost eight years now. Um, started in uh, in recruitment agency, so I was in a recruitment agency in Cardiff that moved around the country, so I had a bit of a journey, not just um, in my career, but on the uh on the geographical side as well um so my job here at hack job is i'm involved with uh let me just check the q a just to make sure we're not having any problem there we go cool um so uh oh sorry guys um so uh i've been involved in uh can you can you can't see the the, the q a cup clock on your account side can you no we've just got the uh, the, the speaker i wanted to make sure that i'm uh ruined the slides so <laughs> sorry um so i've kind of been involved with recruitment both from uh an agency perspective before moving into hack job my job at hack job is client facing so i work with uh any clients that we bring on from an account management perspective um, as well as heading up our uh, customer success team. So our customer success team, what they do um, on a day-to-day -day basis is work with our clients um, to make sure that they're getting the most from the solution, whether that is talking about how they are using it on a day-to-day -day or product features that they're interested in us um, building for them uh, or kind of any integrations. And we'll go through some integrations later on. Cool, so uh, what we'll be covering today. Uh, James, if you can do this slide, because it's uh, it's popped up in the Q&A, hasn't left my screen, so I can't. Yeah, uh, no problem. So, so today, obviously, we've just introduced who we are. Um, we will be talking away about, uh, through the, uh, the future of re remote working and how it's actually now, um, and then touching on the importance of a, a solid employer brand, um, followed by uh, some new product features, which we brought in to sort of help ease this for our clients and then obviously the opportunity for some for some questions and answers cool. um, so I, I think a good place to start for us just to give you a bit of an introduction of who we are um, so i wanted to touch on our, our mission uh, so ultimately our mission is to maximize people's potential we believe in dreaming big yet searching small um, is a secret to a successful job search uh, ultimately, we want people to find the job that they want um, with the best companies and be rewarded for what they deserve. Um, we do this by helping brands to deliver the best possible candidate experience um, and filling their roles in the qu quickest possible time. Cool. So I guess from a remote working perspective, 
Um, none of us really expected this to uh, kick off so quickly. Um, I know myself that uh, from a experience perspective, I've never really spent too much time remote working. Most of my career has been spent uh, very office bound, given what I do on a uh, on day to day. So I think that the the COVID situation has uh, thrown up a few curveballs okay. as we we see when uh, speaking to clients. I, I think a lot of clients weren't prepared for this situation, but um, we are a uh, adaptable market in a lot of ways. Um, so we're all kind of finding our way around it. I, I guess what's interesting from a um, from a perspective of what candidates are kind of interested in in the market um i've actually got a friend that works at buffer so i know what they do from an onboarding perspective um from a, and remote working is that all their staff work remotely anyway so there's um 99 of the employees um are interested in remote working in some form or another um so i think it's important that clients and uh any potential companies start thinking about what they're going to do to combat this at the moment we didn't expect it was going to be this far on the agenda in 2020. Um, but I think that maybe this is an opportunity within the market to, to uh, utilize this opportunity and, and look at how, how we can change the way we work. Yeah. I don't I know agree, you're Darren. It's, it's, it's been on the cards for a while coming through, but uh, I think ultimately this has just accelerated a lot of things at the moment. Um, companies, as you say, probably aren't prepared for it um, or they weren't prepared to, to launch it quite so quickly, but it's one of those things that, needs must and we've all got to adapt and, and, and change yeah and I, I i was listening to um to a video this morning um that was based on an adp uh study that they conducted over the last couple of months and i found what was quite interesting is that the study says that actually the the, t the most productive people work in the office only one day a week uh, which i actually found fascinating because i know from my side one of the most challenging things has been a lot of the conversations that I don't really realize I have on a day-to-day -day basis with, um, with colleagues uh, in the business was as well as clients I'm now realizing how often I'll be having conversations about the, the little things so I think it's uh, important to look at why we're doing meetings now so I think a lot of meetings are in the diary and what are you trying to achieve so what I found really fascinating when um, we're speaking to those guys was a little bit of a breakdown for your tasks on a day-to-day -day. so creating mini tasks for okay what am I looking to focus on this morning and what am I looking to achieve and then getting to the end of your periods and then doing little wins so tallying up what okay what did I do against this target so I kind of find that fascinating to uh, to talk about um, so obviously like like in the um, other statistics there the remote working the productivity kind of goes up so I know from my side, James, you'll probably be able to get me some insight because you work even further afield than I, you live further afield than I do. But I know from my side, it's kind of changed the way that I've worked. So because I'm kicking off the daily commute um, out of my diary so I can start working a lot easier, it's meaning that I'm a, kind of a lot more relaxed when going into, uh, into the day because I'm not dealing with the, uh, the daily commute of the Northern Line. So it's kind of changed that on my aspect too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I live out in Guildford. Um, I'll be honest, I've always worked from home occasionally, uh, but I've always been quite against it because I've always thought that the best things happen um, in the office. Um, and I still truly believe that, you know, those little conversations that you mentioned that uh, you just don't have when you're working from home. But, but the one thing I've noticed, and it's not just across Hacker Job, but all businesses I've been speaking to, uh, they have been able to work from home. Um, roles that traditionally wouldn't work from home are able to do so and I think it's been forced because we all now have to and we needs must um, and it's encouraged businesses to, to, to adapt and learn um, I think what I've actually found though is, is people are communicating more now they're working at home and I think that's vitally important that you need to over communicate um, in order to make sure you do have those little conversations business moves forward um, yeah, it, it can work. I'm still looking forward to get back into the office, but uh, but it's definitely, you know, it's definitely possible. And I, I'd be interesting to see when we do go back to normal, how uh, if we have moved into a time of change of, of people be working remote more often.
Yeah, I, I think that's going to be the fascinating aspect of all markets after this. It's it's not just what is happening right now. It's what impact is this going to have um, as a as a global business world. Um, so I think that it's it's all well and good to see this as this is the um, this is the current situation. But in reality, I, I think a lot of businesses afterwards this will become the norm um, yeah. because we're we're eventually going to come out of of this crisis. And I, I saw some statistics this morning which are, were terrifying in some ways about where the the, the global market is going to be. But I think really the companies that are going to come out of this the strongest are the ones that can be able to adapt to this situation. Um, yeah. which obviously is great with kind of what we're doing at Hagjob to uh, try helping at that. Absolutely agree. Um, so we, uh, and I'll, I'll make sure that we get this available back on the, uh, on social media afterwards. Um, but we actually did a uh, developer satisfaction um, survey in, in May last year. Um, and a lot of what came up on, on it was flexibility of work. So I think the flexibility of work, um, right now is very different to flexibility of work when uh, when we kind of come out of this crisis. So um, uh, in that, a lot of candidates and particularly developers were talking about the uh, ability to uh, to be more flexible, not just in, um, in location, but also working hours, um, which is something that working from home, like I say, from a community perspective will allow people to do. Some people work, uh, I know personally, I, I'm very much an early riser. So um, I'm often in the office by about half seven um, and then I finish up at about five o'clock, which means I can get home, um, see my partner and um, spend a, a kind of nice evening um, winding down. But I know also uh, within the office, we've got people that are much more um, open to kind of late rising. So starting work at, at half nine and then finishing at seven o'clock because that's the way that their, their family how kind of run their lives so i think that's going to be fascinating afterwards to to see what changes in that regard yeah it'd be interesting to see if it actually extends the working business day um you know if you've got flexible workforce who are uh, who are starting early and then someone's starting later um you know the traditional nine to five might disappear but actually it could be positive for both personal and business yeah and um i, I know from my family perspective, a lot of the work that my dad does um, is working remotely anyway. So he's got teams that are based in, uh, he's got a team in India, he's got one in Atlanta, um, and then he's got one just outside Madrid. So due to the way that those teams are kind of made up from a, uh, from a time zone perspective, it's always been important for, for him to work on a flexible schedule. And I think that within the London market, in a lot of places I've worked in the past, it's been very stringent. Um, and not so flexible, um, which I think I, I would uh, envisage that will change after this because a lot of businesses are going to go kind of global as a result of this that aren't already because that's where a lot of the customer base is going to be and that's where a lot of this will open up opportunities for, uh, for companies to become wider uh, as a kind of scope of the business. So it's going to be interesting to see what kind of happens on that side, and especially from a developer perspective, what happens after that. Cool. So I've still got the Q&A slide up at the moment, so you might need to uh, <laughs> tell me what's on the, uh, on the slide at the moment. So yeah, we, we, we've jumped onto the importance of a solid employer brand. Cool. Um, and, and, and honestly, I think for me, this is one of the, uh, the biggest challenges brands are experiencing right now. Um, Actually conducting an interview remotely is, uh, is very easy. Um, obviously with web-based software like we're using right now and other technologies. Um, but the, the challenge comes uh, when showcasing your employer brand. Um, it's been spoken about a lot recently, but you know, even you know, now it's more important to, to, to utilize this. You know, what is it like to actually work in your business? Um, for a long time now, there's been a lot of conversation about the death of the CV and the job description. Um, but with remote interviewing in the current situation, um, I think this will really accelerate this conversation. Um, the traditional methods may not now be fit for purpose. Um, I mean, with remote interviewing, brands have to be far more creative uh, with how they showcase their brand to prospective employees in different ways. Um, from our experience, and I know we were talking about this, Darren, um, 
candidates are, are very happy to, to interview remotely, um, but they still want to visualize what it's like to work for a company before they accept that role. Um, you know, that's still important, you know, and it's, it's more so important that companies can, can visualize this now. Um, you know, not being able to come into the office, onto site, amplifies this change ultimately. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that uh, from a from a brand um, perspective, there's uh, it's going to be a transition in the market. So brands previously and historically have been able to uh, simply go, okay, you can visit our amazing offices um, and you can do this and that. But I think that from a uh, perspective of not just right now, but in the future, as uh, work becomes a lot more kind of remote, companies are going to have to uh, increase their brand elsewhere. So uh, I know there's a company that uh, signed up on the on the platform this week alone, and their their tech team is actually based out in uh, in, in Germany. So. Uh, they have done a phenomenal job when I look at their branding online about what it's like to work there. Um, and there's a, another one of our, our clients, um, Kanos, for example. They do a lot of their work is is done on client site, given what they do as a consultancy. So they've had to focus on their employer brand um, and what it's like to work in the business. So it goes far beyond at this point um, just what are you doing in a day to day when you're in the office? It's what do you offer from a uh, family um, background? How can we integrate into your lives a little bit further? So stuff like um, cycle to work schemes and um, childcare vouchers and that kind of stuff. So it's I guess the from a brand and from a expectation from candidates now on what needs to be offered by companies. It, goes way beyond having good laptops and all that kind of stuff. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, right now I'd urge talent teams to really take a look at their candidate journey from the ground up, um, you know, from application right through to offer um, and make sure it paints the right picture of your business. Um, for this, I generally think you might need to get quite granular as well. Um, for example, the process to recruit a salesperson, is likely to be very different to the process you use to, to recruit a software engineer. Um, so you really need to dig into that and, and, and make sure you understand those unique little journeys. Um, I think from an organization perspective, you know, a good place to start and a potentially a quick win uh, could be to look at your careers pages. Um, as, a, as, a, as an individual working with companies and, and, and understanding their requirements, I spend a lot of time uh, talking to them about their, their career pages. And if, if I'm completely honest, uh, most of them are not fit for purpose. And they're often a mess, difficult to navigate, um, even to find available jobs, which is, is criminal considering it's a career page. Um, you know, what is the story that you're telling about your brand if it looks like this. Yeah, I agree. Like, I think if you look on a lot of careers pages, um, I was doing it uh, this morning on a, on a couple of different brands, um, just to understand that journey, because I, I, you, you kind of raised the point before I got to it. Uh, <laughs> and I, I guess from a career page perspective, a lot of time it's very hard to navigate. So it's, as, a, as a candidate, you're, the time you're gonna spend looking for a job in a particular company, it's going to be very, very low. So the harder and uh, you make it for someone to look through your careers page, the less likely they're going to be able to, they're going to apply to you directly. So what we're working with a lot of clients on at the moment, and I worked with a particular client involved in broadcasting about 18 months ago, um, just to look at their kind of candidate journey, because the more interactive you can make it, the better. Um, yeah. I guess that when I'm, when I'm uh, looking at, um, at careers pages, a lot of time it's it's very um, very word orientated, and it takes a lot to figure out. Okay, why should I join this company? Which in the market we're in right now is it's a, it's going to be a more than ever a candidate driven market after what happens as a result of um, this situation. So candidates are going to have a lot of different options when they are looking at jobs. So what are you doing on your side to make sure that you stick out to, um, to the candidates you're, you're trying to attract? 
Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And I, I think for one thing that really stands out for me is that careers pages are often very, very broad. They're trying to cover all touch bases. Yeah, agreed. Um, but, you know, I think companies need to, to understand that they're, they're, they're recruiting different teams. Very rarely are they recruiting for the same sort of person and for the same team. Um, so you need to, you know, identify that you're looking at different personas and different require, requirements for different teams. Um, and then, you know, realize that one type of message isn't, isn't gonna, gonna work. So, you know, I would suggest that, you know, talent teams borrow from their marketing teams and take the approach of breaking down the different personas you're attracting. Um, identify the different information that each group requires to build a picture of what it's like working for you. Um, I mentioned it earlier, obviously, you know, for example, sales culture, it's going to be very different to recruiting for a technical team. Um, so, you know, you need to identify those different personas, break them down and make sure you've got different messages for different individuals. I know, I know Darren, you did a, did a webinar a couple of weeks back with Vodafone on from, uh, from uh, telco to, to, to techco. Um, and, you know, how important it was that they changed their messaging to approach, to attract the right individuals. Great. Yeah. And I think the, uh, not to uh, type class, but I guess if I was a, a front end developer, or a um, or a UI UI designer or something along those ends that's looking at the uh, at the the journey of when you're interacting with um, with websites or whatever, and I'm going onto a career's website and the usability is is awful. I'm starting to look at this company and going, okay, like so clearly they're not uh, that fussed about the user journey from a careers perspective. Um, so what am I kind of walking into? Like, do they care about the, uh, the user journey, uh, of their actual software? Like where, where does the kind of the, the butt fall? So I think that companies are going to need to look at those kind of areas and, uh, as well as face to face. So if I'm a, uh, if I'm a candidate that, and we'll get onto, um, some of the integrations we're doing in a little while, but if I'm a candidate and I'm looking at a, a new job, and the the face to face um, stage is uh, two face to faces. When I'm looking at that, I'm I'm starting to think, okay, how flexible are is this brand? Um, am I able to get through the process um, yeah. quick enough? Because especially within the the tech market, the 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 candidates will be uh, filled with a plethora of different opportunities to look at. So the less uh, painful you can make that journey, the better. Um, okay. So it kind of it starts at the careers page, but goes all the way through processes. Yeah, I think you know, I think what companies need to realise right now, if you're if you're you're interviewing remotely, every little thing is amplified. So you know, it's been spoken about for a long time now about the candidate journey. There's there's so many different technologies out there that help you to streamline it. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, yeah. Technology is great, but actually, if you haven't got your house in order, if yeah. you haven't got your your interview processes nailed down, if you haven't got the interactions that you have with your candidates mapped out, um, it's going to be amplified at a time when you're 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 hiring remotely because that's the image that candidates ex experience from you. It's not the you can't paper over the, those cracks by having great hiring managers bringing them to a great office with ping pong tables, free beer and things like that. You, you, it's the little interactions, those, you know, when they first reach out, what's your job description like? How do you interact with them when they've sent their CV in? How do uh, you interact with them through the, through the recruitment process? Those are all amplified right now. So you need to realize that, break those different processes down and make sure they're as streamlined and as, as clear as possible. Great. Um, and I, I, I guess something that I've seen a lot of companies move to in the, in the last uh, kind of six months is, and I, I think it's, I think it's a great move, um, is, is video um, job descriptions. Yeah. So I appreciate that maybe you can't do this on, on every role because it's quite a time consuming um, job. But I think video job descriptions are great because it gets you a bit more buy-in about what the company is trying to uh, trying to do. So, at any given time, sorry to belay the point, but any given time, the candidate will have 30, 40 different roles that they can 
they can be involved in. So I think that the more you can sell your brand, which comes across in in those kind of descriptions, the better. Um, so I don't just mean a, a, a job description where you're sitting down and talking um, through text and texts of the uh, of the job. I mean, talking about, okay, what is the candidate going to be involved with? Can you do some kind of uh, content where you're walking around the office and showing the, um, the environment that they're going to be in? I know one of the clients I used to work with, one of their biz, big in sec- selling factors and candidates always said it when they went in for face-to-face interviews is that they didn't expect that it would be such a, a uh, tech-driven market, uh, tech-driven company that you walked in and you could see code everywhere around the business. So I think the more you can, um, and I, I guess this goes across all different aspects of the company, not just tech, but tech kind of falls at the forefront and it often is the hardest roles to fill um so the more you can sell what someone's going to have when they walk in the better yeah on it. yeah definitely agree cool. um should we move on to the next slide darren yeah so i i think i wanted to wanted to highlight this actually because um so this is our latest white paper that we've created it's uh, cracking the code building an evp for tech and i think it touches on a lot of what you've just said there um you know, ultimately, and this is specifically for, for tech, but I can't highlight this enough that you need to understand your processes for all of your different recruitment processes for different teams. Um, ultimately, within tech, and I'm sure everyone here is aware of this, that it's, it's very hard to stand out in technical recruitment. Um, it's well known that there are more technical roles than there are uh, candidates to fill them. Um, and this means that candidates are often being bombard- bombarded with roles um that often are not right, a right fit for them um candidates can often receive you know 20 messages a day from recruiters um so you know cutting through that noise is vital um and this is highlighted in this white paper here um you know the average time to hire for a software developer in the uk is 58 days um so it's an incredibly tricky to scenario um so what we've we've highlighted in this white paper is actually what we call the trio of interest um where where candidates technical candidates are looking for free things um they want to use interesting tech um they want to solve interesting problems and they want to work with interesting people and ultimately if you can't tick at least two of the above of these um these three things then you're not going to be able to hire technical talent efficiently and especially not going to be able to hire the best of the technical talent um so you know I would, I would highly recommend you, you, you read this white paper, download this. It's available on our website and we'll share it around later. Um, but it, and it highlights some really interesting things like this. But I think this approach should be taken for each department with your organisation. Yeah, agreed. Like, I, I think that that's a lot of time people don't think about their EVP enough. Um, so I know it's, it's, some, it, it, it's a buzzword you hear in the industry. So people are thinking about their employee brand and they might have employee brand teams. But it's, a lot of time it comes down to more than just what is someone saying during your interview process. Because ultimately, um, it, it, the reality is that people aren't going to say too much about, um, about your process while they're in the process. So it's what are you doing to capture all this afterwards? So are you, uh, are you speaking to, uh, to not just candidates that you, you end up bringing into organisation, but also candidates that don't come to your organisation? Yeah. And is there anything that you can do on, on your side afterwards uh, to, to alter that? Or are you stagnating and, and keeping your offering exactly the same forever? Yeah, uh, yeah. brands have to be aware of this with, you know, pages like, uh, like Glassdoor, for example. You know, yeah. the message that, you know, candidates are talking now. You know, we, we're very aware that, you know, anyone can be a promoter or a detractor from a brand. Um, the same from recruitment organizations. So you need to protect those individuals, any person at any stage in your, in your process, if they have a bad experience, they can talk about it and that can be really damaging to your brand. Yeah. And I, I think uh, touching on, on Glassdoor, I think that the, they're great in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> the problem with uh, Glassdoor and those kind of websites is that I always look at them very much um, like, uh, like an Expedia. Um, where I personally would never leave a, uh, a good review. I would only leave an, an incredible review 
or a really bad review. Um, so I think the problem with a lot of those and where companies sometimes fall foul is that they're, um, let's be honest, a lot of the organizations that I personally work with are big enterprise companies. So the environment that uh, a developer might be getting could be very different to what a contact center person is, uh, is receiving. Um, but the problem is that that glass door is for the into a, entire organization. So I think what companies um, need to establish is a uh, is kind of an overarching uh, situation in in a organization. So don't just look at what is happening on uh, in your uh, in your tech team. Look at what is happening in the contact centers. Look at what's happening in your finance team, your sales team. Because I know I've worked with a couple of brands in the past that have fallen foul to that, where they might be, uh, their head office might have an incredible um, environment to work in. But because there's been other areas that haven't been so great, um, it's meant that their glass door suddenly has taken a knock. And can they do pay attention to the glass door? Like as much as I, I think it's um, a area that, companies and candidates should focus well sorry candidates should focus a little bit less on when making decisions um, because it can uh, it can not always be the best reflection of what an organization is like companies need to realize that candidates do pay attention to it yeah. so um, anything you can do to make sure that your entire business has a great environment is going to help you long term yeah it's, it's, it's about ownership it really is. It's about everyone be, taking own, ownership of those spaces, realizing how you know how much they affect the business, and, and you know you can you can do a lot of small things, and you know I could do a whole webinar on this, uh, on how to actually uh, look after your glass door reviews and your external appearance. Um, so it's yeah, make sure everyone's aware how important this is. Cool. Anything else to add on that? James? No, I'm very aware of time actually. So uh, yeah, maybe we should, we should move on to the next slide. Um, cool. Yeah, I wanted to highlight some things uh, to consider when, to, well, which need to be remembered when you're interviewing remote. Um, and these, uh, you know, it's so important to remember the small things. As I mentioned earlier, they can be amplified. Uh, amplified. Uh, so, you know, for example, communication. Um, you know, remote interviewing may feel like an entirely different ball game but in reality it's uh, it's easy and it's more efficient than face-to-face -face interviewing um however uh it's more important to prepare candidates um let them know what to expect um and give them an outline of the full ex uh, full interview experience um will they be having a phone interview will they be having a video interview will they have to prepare a task all those little things if you can outline in front of them um beforehand it's going to be so important um, testing your processes as well. Um, it might sound simple, um, but before interviewing takes place, send your candidates any software they may need prior to the interview, along with instructions on how to down download and install the program. Um, this will save obviously both parties time, um, make the candidate feel more relaxed because ultimately that's what you want to do um, and give them the best possible candidate experience. I guess on that point, I think that that's what companies, uh, it's, it's, a small, it's a small thing, but I think often companies um, need to get that information out, maybe a day beforehand, because the, the earlier you get this across, the better. I think that especially in this environment, uh, there's a lot of different tools that people are using to do remote interviews, whether it's uh, Hangouts or Skype or Teams or or, um, or Zoom, for example. Yeah. With us. Um, so uh, the, the earlier you get this out, the better, because candidates, um, if they're feeling nervous about an interview, you don't want to make them feel more nervous because they don't know where this interview is taking place. So yeah, I think, I think people are so used to doing face-to-face. -face. You know, they become used to it, and it's become a, a well-ingrained process. Um, and even though, actually, as I mentioned earlier, you, online doing everything online remote interviewing can actually be simpler and quicker um it's so important that you do prepare and you're organized up front because if you're not it can slow the whole process down and can give a really bad experience yep. because as i say you know the little things can be amplified yep great 
Uh, yeah, being organised as well. I think, uh, you know, this kind of follows on really, uh, but make sure the whole process is prepared and all of the interviewer team are ready in advance. Um, you know, get your hiring managers to think about what's in their background if they're using a video. Um, you know, you don't want them to be having family walking by and kids and I get that, you know, life carries on and we've all got to, to adjust. But where possible, you know, making sure that your, your backgrounds are clear and it's a, a quieter place as possible. Um, also, make sure they're on time. You don't want to leave candidates waiting on the, the dead silence of a, a, a Zoom room. Um, and also make sure that, that everyone's presentable. It's so easy when you're at home to, to drop into real dress down, um, not do your hair, you know, things like that. But make sure you are presentable as best as possible. Um, but also being human. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a playoff there, I think. I think you, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm, uh, cause I was thinking about those last two points. I was like, what is my background? What is my hair like? And like <laughs> um, cause I, I, I think they're really valid points. I, I think that w just because this is, uh, an environment you live in doesn't necessarily mean that it's, uh, I don't know, don't have Metallica photo, um, uh, posters in the background or something like that. <laughs> um, so like, I think that the, the vast majority of webinars I've been on um, have been kind of set up great. Um, but I think the extra minute that you take to think about that kind of stuff can make the difference because like you say, stuff does get amplified. So I'd hope that people wouldn't uh, decline an interview based on Metallica photo or, uh, or poster. Um, but anything you can do to make sure that you're putting yourself across in the best way is going to be huge. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, coming on to the next point here, the, the, the elevator pitch, um, again, you know, individuals uh, want to visualize what it's like working for an organization. And if yep. they can't come into the office, then, you know, you need to show it in another way. So by elevator pitch, I mean, like showcasing what it's like to work in your business. Um, it's so important when conducting video interviews, maybe show videos of, of the office or photos of the space um, and the types of amenities you have. Um, make sure all of this is prepared beforehand so you can paint that picture as best as possible. Yep, great. Cool. So a little bit about what we're doing um, here at Hacklock. So um, one of the, uh, so we've essentially launched three new products and features um, off the back of, uh, of the COVID-19 situation. So the first one that um, James briefly touched on was the employee branding page. Um, so from that side, uh, what we're doing is making sure that a lot of the content that is on your website is more visible to, to candidates um, and making sure that they are able to understand the message that you're trying to get out. The second one um, is around integration. So what we've um, done in the last week and a half um, is we've developed a integration into both Zoom and Google Hangout. The way that that's going to work is that a uh, employer can utilize um, our own Zoom and, uh, and Hangout accounts um, because anyone that uses Zoom uh, will probably appreciate that the uh, Zoom, unless you're using premium, does have a time limit on it, which I believe is 40 minutes, which uh, can be uh, a hindrance if you're having face-to-face -face interviews. So what we're doing on our side is we're integrating that into a, uh, a workflow whereby candidates can be uh, given access to our own uh, Zoom accounts so that the interviews can take place. Uh, that's also gonna be the case on, on Hangouts as well just to essentially make that process as smooth as possible um, throughout. So there's, there's not the problems that uh, James has highlighted a minute ago, which often take place in uh, remote interviews. And there you go, just showing you how to uh, that integration works. Yeah, and I think it's so important, you know, it's, it's like though that comment you meant, mentioned about Zoom, you know, making sure that you're aware that that could be a challenge. Um, making sure you do have those those premium products there in place for interviews because you don't want an interview cutting out halfway through. Exactly, exactly. I think the the first impression is the oftentimes the only impression you're going to get. You've got a couple of minutes there to impress a candidate, 
Uh, and uh, at the same time, but for, for the candidate, I, I think what we've what uh, we haven't highlighted probably as much in, in this so far is the candidate as well. So if you're a candidate, make sure you're downloading all this beforehand. If you're being given access to all these tools and you know where the interview is going to be taking place, don't just go and try downloading that, that software a minute before the interview is going to take place. Because ultimately, if you have problems with your laptop due to any kind of firewall or anything like that, that interview then isn't going to take place. Um, and if you're only saying a minute before that you've got kind of some kind of software problems, it doesn't look like the greatest first impression for for that um, potential employer. So I think that everyone across the board probably needs to bear that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Uh, and then, uh, so you've got the lovely faces of our head of product and our CEO, Mark on the right hand side there. So um, this is the uh, the pair program tool that we've developed um, over the last week. So we are in the process of uh, rolling this out. So the final, um, uh, final revamp was done this morning. So I know that we've been having calls with uh, quite, a few, quite a few clients over the last, four or five working days just to understand how they're going to be um, utilizing in their process. So I know that a lot of clients have pair programming sessions during their face-to-face, -face, yeah. which has meant that uh, without a solution like this, they ultimately couldn't do their whole process, which would be, uh, I guess, a hindrance to much of an extent on making a decision because Let's be honest, the tech market is an expensive market to hire in. So you want to make sure that you are making the right decisions on the people that you bring in. Um, pair programming is it's a hard task to do because it's not just looking at your coding ability. It's also looking at your ability to, to converse and work closely with someone on, on their coding. So uh, we oftentimes, and this, I guess this is advice for, for candidates when it comes to pair programming. Um, I would always say that over communicate rather than under communicate, um, which is why we've, we've, uh, implemented the video into, into the pair programming, but it's all well and good, put it in kind of chat, but you need to be thinking about how you are communicating with that other person during that session. So the pair programming, you will be able to do it both from a, uh, a backend, uh, and front end perspective on the first iteration, it's going to be JavaScript focused. So we'll be able to uh, to help clients that are looking to uh, to utilize React and uh, and Vue. Uh, I know talking to our head product that the plan of action is that in the second uh, iteration, um, it's going to be uh, we're going to put TypeScript and CoffeeScript and um, also Angular into the testing as well. But from a back-end perspective, I haven't spoken to Dow, Dow I had a product this morning, we'll be able to support 200 back-end languages, wow. which is, I, I couldn't name um, all of them. So I will be able to cover pretty much every client on that side. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, to, to tie this back round, I mean, obviously we are a technical recruitment solution. Um, but I think what we're, you know, the, the important thing to highlight here is that it's about making sure you have the right tools in place to assess the candidates you're recruiting for. So yes, if you're, you know, recruiting technical talent, pair programming is, is a really important solution. Um, but if you're recruiting sales individuals, then make sure you've got the right tools in place for that, for marketing, for example. So there's lots of different options out there and there's so much software out there, different tools in place that you can bring in to streamline your, your, your recruitment processes it's about exploring that and making sure um you've got those in place to to to, to, to be as effective as possible yeah great, great. i think i think just to come back around to the branding pages actually i think this highlights my, my my point earlier as well about careers pages um you know the, the whole point of the technical branding pages are, are to help our clients to position themselves as a technical recruiter so on these pages they can show showcase their unique business um, so for example, things like their, what their tech stack consists of, um, the de different benefits that they offer, um, that make them stand out. Um, and also the culture that the candidates can expect working there. Um, and again, you know, across 
all of your your different processes start breaking these out um you know not just technical but sales marketing all your finance all your different departments break them out paint that picture of what it's like to work there because you're going to be the one as a business who stands out compared to competition if you do this yeah yeah i agree i agree definitely um anything else to add on the on the pair programming james no, as I say, I think just to highlight my point, which is just to make sure that you explore the tools out there that will help you best provide the best experience. Because, uh, as I say, every little thing will be amplified um, at the moment. Uh, and I, I hopefully think that it will lead to a more streamlined recruitment process in the future um, when we do get back to whatever normal is. Yeah, normality, should we call it? Mm-hmm. Um, cool. Okay. So that is taking us through the majority of what we're presenting. Um, it'd be good if we can spend a little bit of time on, on the Q and a stuff. Um, James talking about, uh, the, the making sure you have the right software. Uh, I think my computer has, uh, has frozen itself other than the, uh, other than the camera. <laughs> so if you can just fill up the, the Q and A's, I'm more than happy to answer them as they come through. Yeah, I think one which probably is more directed at you, Darren, is uh, how are our clients adapting to remote hiring? Cool. So um, I think, well, I, I think because of the plethora of different industries that our clients go across, um, everyone's coping in, in slightly different ways. Uh, I think, for example, consultancies are trying to find some kind of normality around it, the difficulty being um, the end clients. Uh, their decisions are essentially based on that a lot of the time, but from a from a uh, overarching perspective, I think the industry is coping well. the The vast majority of of uh, clients who work with have transitioned their stages. So, if for example that they were doing, uh, let's say, a phone interview and then a technical interview and then a, uh, a technical test and then a face to face. I think currently in the market we're in now because everything is needing to be done remotely. So people are speeding that up. So there's one client that uh, we work with that their time to hire has gone down significantly as a result of this. Candidates are more available in the market at the moment um, because they're not having to uh, to kind of commute as I keep raising. So um, there's now candidates that are, wouldn't previously been available for, for calls can now be taking calls at different times of the day. So I would advise any clients that aren't already doing it to play around with your, uh, with your current process. So if you are currently doing uh, two face faces, a tech test and two calls, I would advise that wherever possible, you're moving that to a HR screen. HR screen is for me personally, um, although others in the industry may disagree, uh, for me, a HR recruiter screening call is to to cover off anything that is kind of sticks out as someone being completely wrong for a for a process, rather than um, you wiping out someone based on a, a small fit. Um, and then I would advise that people do a technical call um, wherever possible, rather than technical test, technical test. Uh, again, you're kind of taking away um, your your selling point, um, and then face to face again remotely. But I would advise wherever possible that uh, companies are utilising different technical tests that they can do remotely. So, for example, the pair program that I was talking about earlier, um, wherever possible, doing something like that, so that you are still making the right decisions on people you're bringing into the business. So I think that the we would always advise that clients are um, choosing the right process, but also then choosing a process that still means that they are bringing the right talent into the business. Yeah, I think, I think one thing that, you know, I've noticed as well is, is candidates are going through processes a lot quicker at the moment. Um, yeah. from, from being able to book in initial screening calls to, to actually being able to go through to face-to-face and so on. Have you, have you experienced that as well? Yeah, so... Uh, Myself and our head of talent looked at some interesting stats um, last week. And of the uh, interviews that were requested and happened, 
71% of those uh, interviews are actually now taking place in the first 70, uh, 70, uh, 48 hours, apologies, 71% in the first 48 hours. So interviews are taking place a lot quicker, which is why clients are now managing to get people through process. So I think that anyone that is still working on a time to hire of 58 days, um, which is the, the average for what we saw um, in the industry in, in Q1, I, I think to be brutally honest, companies will start missing out on talent. So the more you can streamline your process, the better. Yeah, yeah, that's a really, really good point. And, uh, and, and I think this, this situation is helping companies to streamline their, their, their processes because where you're having to organize a remote workforce, you're actually getting the relevant people all on the, the one call at one time, rather than having multiple different interviews of different people because they're in the workplace. Um, so hopefully this can really streamline processes, and improve them in that sense. Great. Um, so we have another question here. Uh, so our face-to-face -face processes are slightly long-winded. Can you outline your recommended stages for remote interviewing? Cool, so I guess follows on from the previous question. So uh, I would advise that wherever possible, um, a HR screen and then a hiring manager call and then a uh, another call uh but focused on what you would do during a face-to-face -face interview would be my advice so yes the the process needs to adapt slightly because of the circumstance but you should still be doing a in-depth um face-to-face -face. so i would suspect that you whereas you the candidates are probably spending seven eight hours per company per process i think that streamlining it down to about four hours for those three stages is now the optimum way to do it yeah, definitely. I think I think three stages. I, I'd question any company doing more than three stages for, um, you in know, the environment. I agree. In the, in the current environment, yeah, it's, it seems crazy. You, the, it's definitely possible to streamline processes and get what you need from it um, both ways. Yeah, agreed. Um, what would you advise companies? Uh, so what would you advise to companies on how their careers page uh, to make their careers pages more targeted towards developers, technical talent? Um, so I guess it kind of goes back to what I was saying um, earlier. I, I think that the careers page should be somewhat broken down. So what uh, someone in sales is looking for on the careers page will probably be very different to what developer is looking for. Developer is going to, they want to understand uh, a little bit about the projects they'll be working on, a little bit about the environment they'll be working with and also the tools they'll be utilizing. So anything you can do um, around that, the better. Uh, not to name anyone in particular, but there's a, there's a client that we work with that when you go onto their careers page, they have the list of the different technologies that they use. So uh, I know like Docker is on there and Reactor on there and, and Java, the latest version of Java. So the more information you can give a candidate about why they should work for you, beyond simply saying your your company name that and thinking that's the selling point, the better. Um, companies that win in this market aren't always the companies that are shouting the loudest within their uh, marketing and the fact you see them on TV every day is the ones that are able to offer an opportunity, uh, interesting opportunities to candidates. Yeah, and I think for me, you know, careers pages, God, simplify them. Like make make them searchable, make them easy to navigate. Um, you don't need to be hiding the the jobs you've got on. Maybe split them down though by department, um, and then you can tell a different story about per department, and then have the yeah. role below that. Like making them easy to navigate. God, I don't understand why why they're so complicated. It makes no sense. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I think the uh, as anyone that's worked in e-commerce. Uh, will know themselves the the more clicks you make someone do to get to what they're trying to achieve the more drop off you're going to have so if you can improve um that you're going to get a better click through rate so i think it's important not to make it um too difficult you don't want everyone applying for your job that's relevant but at the same time you want to allow access to to everyone and make those jobs visible uh to the people you're trying to capture yeah I totally agree. And another thing I think people can, should consider is actually um, getting their, their current team to sell the department for them. Yes. You know, getting getting uh, 
staff case studies on there. We always talk about client state case studies for selling and, and, and marketing purposes, but think about the same for, for selling your business. Make sure you've got your, your staff doing case studies on what it's like to work for you as an organization. Great. I think we've got time for, uh, for maybe one, maybe two questions, depending on um, how long we've, uh, how, lo how quickly we get through them. Yeah, so, so I think there's a good one here. If we're looking to hire senior developers, should we still give them a technical test or should we consider their experience more so, especially if they have a wealth of experience? Good question. Um, so interesting stat that I saw the, uh, the other day. So the candidates that are more senior, uh, it, it's, it's kind of an obvious statement, but candidates that are more senior tend to do less um, technical tests. Um, so it kind of depends on the seniority of the candidate. I would never advise, um, to be totally honest, that you are getting a, um, uh, uh, I don't know, 100K candidate to be doing a four hour uh, assignment. If you're trying, if what you're trying to do with that technical test is just to make sure that someone has um, a, a, a baseline of what you need in the business, then great. Put yourself in a, that create a half an hour test, but companies when they're doing four to six hour tests, like you're just not going to capture these candidates. Um, so I would say it depends on the, um, on the circumstances of it. So think about the market that you're trying to capture. So DevOps, for example, or front end, for example, these candidates have got a lot of different options, um, probably more than any of the other markets. So I would advise that if you're going to do technical tests, make them short, make them precise and make them achieve what you're trying to rather than just doing a technical test because that's what the industry is doing. Brilliant. Really good. I think that that's all we have time for on questions, actually. Um, I think one thing to highlight is, you know, we could have, we are going to be doing other webinars over the, over the coming weeks. I think we've got one going live soon to go for, for remote onboarding. Um, yep. so for everyone, have one on Friday as well, so. um, but any suggestions obviously on, on what we can cover our experience and things like that please do to do get in contact and we'll, we'll be happy to, to create them cool well thanks for everyone attending um, feel free to reach out to myself or James um, via LinkedIn or uh, via email just for me and my side if you want to contact me my email address is darren at hackerjob.co that's two r's and an e yeah and the same for me is james.bull b-u-l-l -L, at hackerjob.co cool. well thanks for everyone attending um hope to see you on the next webinar thank you very much bye-bye